Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hello, welcome back to Fighting on Film after our week hiatus we had some gremlins in the system but we're back to winning ways this week we welcome matt back from las vegas and we do our patreon pick episode now if you're new around here to the show every month we pitch four movies to our fabulous patreon supporters to vote for by the time you listen to this it'll be february but this month's patreon pick for january was ill met by moonlight from 1957 but if you want to join the patreons and get in on the action for yourself, you can do so for as little as £2.50 per month, and you help keep the mics on here at FOF HQ. But before we go into the movie this week, I thought we'd have a brief chat about all of the um, accolades and nominations being thrown at All Quiet on the Western Front in this year's awards roundup. What do you think about that, Matt? Well, it's it's, it's something like, is it 13 or 9 BAFTAs? No, yeah, um, nine Oscar nominations, fourteen that's it. or something. That's yeah. it. Uh, and I think it's equaled the record for the most number of BAFTA mo- nominations for a film, right? Ever, um, mm. which is incredible. Uh, it really, interesting is. that there were no um, cast nominations within the, within the the Oscar noms. I thought that was interesting. Which. Mm. Yeah. The cast was strong and I thought there were some good performances, but there's lots of um, you know, the production side that is being mm. recognized, which mm. is I can see I can see where the nominations are I coming from, from for that. It's been a bit of a backlash though, isn't there, in Germany? I've been reading about Apparently that. Apparently so. I read an mm. article this week and I sent it to you, didn't I, that said that a lot of uh the German cinema press had found the adaptation to be um a little bit too loose with the original source material because Remark's book is so lauded yes. and you know it's it's a cultural touchstone mm. for Germany, um, rightly so. And a lot of them are, are, are kind of unhappy with how the, the material has been adapted, which it, it's interesting because obviously it's something that I also noticed and, and you noticed as well. And we we both said that it's kind of a shame they didn't just break in entirely and go with a different name. Yes. Um, and acknowledge the nods to the original source material mm. because it clearly isn't an adaptation in the classic sense. Like how, like Land of Freedom, isn't a direct copy of um, Homage Catalonia by George Orwell, yeah. but it borrows yeah. heavily from it. But because it doesn't mm. call it that, it gets away with a lot more. Like maybe yeah. they should have just gone down that route, perhaps. I think that might have kept some of the German cinema critics happy. I don't know how the film was generally received amongst the German. Mm. You know, cinema going Netflix viewing public. Yeah. Um they might have loved it. Um which is entirely yeah, possible. And you critics, know, critics and... and audience are separate mm. entities, aren't they? A hundred percent. Yeah. I think it's interesting. I think it'll be interesting to see what it wins. Um mm. I mean, no doubt the movie is you know, it's painting what, what camp you're in. The movie's over a masterpiece or it's, you know, an affront to the book. Um but, but we have to remember that the the previous adaptations altered things as well from the yeah, original book itself. Yeah. So we can't be too um, stringent in holding the book up mm-hmm. to the film or the film to the book rather. Yeah, because there's there's always artistic license. Although admittedly, the 2022 film does break a lot more. Yeah, uh, from from the book than the previous adaptations do. But it'd be really it... interesting to see how it does. Definitely, no, it will. I know that really do. Um be interesting to see what happens and it leans back into our theory of event movies the war genre becoming yeah. event films yeah, got loads that's, of nominations. that's totally true uh, uh, 1917 got loads <laughs> you know? yeah no i think you're right i think there's a definite argument to say that war movies have become event films especially the successful ones yeah i think there's the smaller ones or the least the, sorry the less successful ones definitely um kind of fall by the wayside a lot yeah. quicker than well look at how devotion's been treated over here with its um with its release like it just got shoved on prime video with not much fanfare yeah i don't understand it i watched it uh <clears throat> this weekend oh, wow. and i really enjoyed it i'm looking forward to covering it i thought it oh, was good. a really well-made um film it felt like an it felt like an old war movie in a lot of ways 
Right. And it, it sets the characters up phenomenally well, I think. But we'll talk about that. That's not what this yeah. week's episode let's is about. Get we'll, back to, we'll let's save get that back for the devotion the, uh, episode the when we come to hand. it. Yeah. Um, but so let's get into Ill Met by Moon. Before we do move on, though, I will say if you haven't listened to our All Quiet on the Western Front review, do go back and, and yeah, take a listen to that because it's a really interesting discussion around. Because I saw it on a cinema screen, Rob saw it at home, as yes. most people probably did. Um, so it's but definitely well worth taking a listen to. Oh, and there's um, another, yes. li- another little aside before we move on. Um, this week, um, while the new episode, while the episode last week may have been delayed, our um, fabulous executive producer, Katie, has been working behind the scenes. And there now is a search function on the player app on our website, fightingonfilm.com, where you can now search for movies. So if there's a movie that you wonder if we've done or, you know, something um, that you, you might be curious of watching, but you might want to listen to our review first, you can go and search it up there. Um, and now we have... Uh, We've done some tinkering and we're now getting spreadsheets through things like that. So hopefully going forward, we're going to get all the information that you guys send us in one place. So now we can work yeah, on the suggestions list and stuff. Yeah. Much yeah. easier. Um, so thanks a lot, Katie, for that. Um, Truly are living in the future now. We really, really are here at Fof HQ that the boffins are that they're going cyber. <laughs> so uh, back to Ill Met by Moonlight. I said that probably about five times already. So uh, cast or production, Matt, the floor is yours. Yeah, so uh, in terms of cast, it's a uh, it's quite a strong cast, and I I think everyone in the film brings a lot to it um, mm. with the material that they've got. Of course, it's led by Deck Bogard, um, who plays uh, Patrick Paddy Lee F- uh, Fermer uh, or Philodem or Philodem. Um, a couple of years prior to this, he had a great turn in Appointment to London in uh, 1951. Yeah. Um, he'd been in uh, They Who Dare and The Sea Shall Not Have Them in 54. He was in Simba in 1955, a very rare British cinema look at the Mau Mau uprising. Brian Desmond Hurst, um, this is the glory director. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we'll definitely have to cover that one, I think. We will. Um, the Wind Cannot Read in 58, which is an interesting one about um, uh, the, the Far East. It's a bit of a, um, a romance where he falls in love with um, uh a training instructor who trains um, people to interrogate Japanese prisoners. Okay. Um, interesting one. He's definitely in his uh, peak, the, isn't he, this era? So like yeah. The, yeah. Throughout the 50s, does lots of great stuff. Um, Password is Courage, HMS to Fight in 62, uh, King and Country in 64, Oh, What a Lovely War in 69, and of course, A Bridge Too Far, which we've covered on the podcast a couple of times. Uh, yeah. In 1977 is his last uh, war movie role. Um, of course, when we cover cast, we only really discuss the war movie roles because if we yeah. went into all the other exactly uh, amazing it's just films that Deck was in, we'd be here for yeah. quite a while. Exactly. Um, then we have uh, Marius Goring, who plays uh, Major General Heinrich Creep, or is it Crepe? Crepe? I think Creep. I've heard people say Crepe, Creep, Crepe, Crepe. 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 There's Crepe. loads of different pronunciations. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I can't remember how they pronounce it in the film, but you just call him the general a lot of the time, don't they? Crep, I think um, they say a lot. Yeah. Uh, so he was uh, in another Powell and Pressburger film in 1939 uh, uh, called The Spy in Black, which is one of those early war noir movies um, with a almost fantastical plot. Uh, Matter of Life and Death in 1946. He was in Odette in 1950, but Ooh. Odette Samson. Um, I Was Monty's Double in '58. The Angry Hills a year later, up from the beach in 1965. And then his last war movie role was Zeppelin with Michael York in 1971. Uh, David Oxley plays Captain uh, William Stanley, or Billy Moss. Um, and his probably best known war movie role is Yesterday's Enemy uh, in 1959, Goodness. which we've already covered on the podcast. Uh, Dimitri Andreas plays Nico Emeris. Uh, Cyril Cusack plays Captain Sandy Rendell, who's a bit of an eccentric character in the film. Mm. Um, he was in Soldiers 3 in 1951, uh, The Man Who Never Was in 56, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, and he was also the gunsmith in the 1973 uh, Day of the Jackal as well, which Ooh, is very a, nice. a, a classic. Uh, Lawrence Payne played Manoli, um, and his credits include A Matter of Life and Death as well, and the court-martial of Major Keller, Wolf Morris uh, played George, um, and he was in Camp on Blood Island in 1958 and Yesterday's Enemy in 
uh, and The Message in 1976. Michael Goff played Andoni uh, Zodakis, and his roles include uh, Reach for the Sky in 1956 with Kenneth Moore, uh, Top Secret in 1984 with Val Kilmer. we got to do that uh, at one point. That's, I know, that's, yeah. We it prob- is good. We probably do. We probably do. Um, Comedy month. War movie spoof month. Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> and then we've got lots of uh, TV credits and Hammer films. And then uh, John Kearney rounds out the, uh, the main cast, uh, and he played Elias. Mm. it's a good cast they're, they are really good they are good um, and there's a lot of a lot of nice banter and there's some nice scenes I think Deck is obviously extremely charismatic in this film I think yes he plays it mostly on like a, a charismatic level um, but yeah a, a cast is interesting it'll be interesting to talk about performances later on I think yeah I think no there is there's definitely um, a caveat there with the uh, the casting so uh moving oh, into oh. almost forgot almost Ooh. forgot two two very small roles oh, go christopher on. lee as a german mp yep yep uh who uh follows deck into a dentist's office and there's a classic dentist's chair scene where the dentist is pretending to do some dental work on someone gets a drill out etc um that's a trope and it is a bit. Um, Christopher Christopher Lee uh, suspects them, and yes. uh, there's a scuffle, and then Dirk shoots him in the stomach with a a little, like, I think it's like a twenty five eight, like like a, like a nickel plated revolver, like isn't a, it? Like yeah. a tiny little twenty five caliber pistol or something like that. Yeah. Maybe a thirty two. It's very cool. Um, Cowboy almost that scene, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a it's mm. a it's a it's a good one. Um, and Lee's lines are predominantly in German, which he delivers. Yes. Very nicely. And of course, uh, he was uh, RAF liaison officer and RAF liaison officer with the SOE. Yeah. So it adds him having he... small roles in like 60s, 50s war movies because he was had a small role in the Cockle Shell Heroes, didn't he, as well? Yeah, he did. Yeah. The... I wonder what he made of it. And then before we move on, um, we have uh, a very young David McCallum. Yeah. Who is a seaman aboard uh, the motor launch who drops off Oxley's character um, and picks up the team at the end of the film. And that's his film debut, and he he stumbles over his one line a little bit I know. at the end. <laughs> Let um, him have another take. He's so I know, I know. Like... Um, but yeah, he's very young in this. He, he doesn't is. have a lot to do. He just stares into the middle distance at the yeah. beginning, and then oh. he sort of ambles up and says, "It's time to go" or something. <laughs> talking of um, David, is it David McCallum? I'm getting that right, aren't I? Um, talking of him, I found some really interesting trivia about him the other day. So strolling through TikTok and there's a, a music uh, TikTok channel that I follow and they do like uh, samples. One of David McCallum's like guitar riffs on his one of his songs was sampled by Snoop Dogg in the 90s. David McCallum has a musical yeah. career. I did not know that. It's Dr. Dre. So it's a Dr. Dre sample, but it's a David right. McCallum song. The Edge by David McCallum. What? What? That's mad. That's an iconic yeah. riff too. I know. That's an absolute nugget for you war movie fans out there. So if you listen to our History Rage episode, um, we said that we've probably given loads of free trivia nuggets to pub quiz heads. And I think <laughs> that's another amazing tiebreak question there. How do you link David McCullen and Dr. Dre? Or Snoop Dogg. <laughs> Only on final film, people. Right, so moving on to the production of Ill Met by Moonlight. Um, there's a fabulous restoration available to watch on ITVX and BritBox if you are a subscriber. Um, it's amazing. Um, so, move uh, the production. So it's based on the abduction of Heinrich Krepp in uh, early 1944, and the script is based off the 1950 memoir, of the same name by W. Stanley Moss. Um, with any relation there, Matt? No? Sadly not. Sadly <sighs> not. I mean, it may be an unknowing relation, but Who knows? not that I know of. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, with Emmerich Pressburger of obviously Powell and Pressburger fame bought the rights to the book in the same year. The film finally went into, into production uh, after a six year hiatus when uh, the when after the success of the Battle of the River Plate in 1956, they signed a one picture deal with the Rank Organisation. Uh, their experience working on the film's production, however, did lead to the end of the 
Archer's produced films. There's a bit of a tumultuous time on this project. So the film, as I mentioned, directed by Emmerich Pressburger and Michael Powell, known for a, a matter of life and death, the life and death of Colonel Blimp, Battle of the River Plate, um, filmed in black and white rather than this division, um, unlike other Pressburger films, which I think is a bit, it's a shame. I think it would bit, have I added think. so much mm. depth Agreed. to the beautiful uh, camera work. Um, it's distributed with a rank organisation, and Powell and Pressburger blamed them for interfering with the film's casting and filming locations, and they didn't like the fact that Dirk Bogart was cast in the lead. Obviously, he was a rank actor at the time. He was known as the, uh, what was it, the 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 darling of the Odeons or the something like that. I can't remember the exact word, uh, the exact phrase. Um, and Powell um, said this of Dirk's casting um, from a passage taken from Dirk's autobiography. Powell wanted a flamboyant young murderer, lover, bandit, a tough Greek-speaking leader of men. Instead, I got a picture postcard hero in fancy dress. He would listen with attention to me while I told him what I wanted. Then he would give me about a quarter of it. In the end, it was, he decided, a mess. How cruel. Yeah, that's unfair. That's <laughs> yeah. unfair. I, and then, if, um, you, if you gave this any more than Derek is giving it, it would be caricaturish, mm-hmm. surely. Surely. Yeah. It's a shame, isn't it? And then Patrick Lee Fermer added this on Dirk's portrayal um, from the same book. Um, Once again, after the fiasco of Elmet by Moonlight, Patrick Lee Fermer felt the film slipped away into cliché and could have stuck rigidly to the actual consternation of events. Dirk, resplendent for a while in the outfit of a Cretan chieftain, cut a dash, but it was a photography... But it was a photograph of himself in a beret, battle dress top and jodhpurs tucked into knee length boots, which he kept as a memento of his career as action hero, his favourite still. Mm. Nice, but also yeah. not nice. <laughs> I, 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 from that, I don't know what he thought of it. I, I, it's I difficult, guess. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's interesting because you, you could have gone a very different route with this film. And I'm sure we'll talk about this in a moment, but Dirk does a more than charismatic enough job. Dirk's doing what um, Dirk does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but and he's, th- he's working with material that I feel isn't top notch. It's not fair I material. I don't think we'll get back to it. Cause I know, I know mm. the route we're going down because we talked about it pre- uh, before we started. Due to the political situation on Crete at the time, the film was shot in the Alps Maritimes in the south of France and the Route du Jour, uh, along with Pinewood Studios for interior shots. Um, Femme and Jeanne, who were on the original uh, operation, did act as advisors on the film. Uh, cinematography was by Christopher Chalice, who worked with uh, Powell and Pressburger on The Battle of the River Plate and The Elusive Pimpernel, among others. And the mm-hmm. score was by Greek composer Mike Theod- Theodocratis. No, Theodorakis, there you go, um, whose works include the score for the Battle of Sejuska with Richard Burton, Zorba yeah. the Greek, and Serpico, which is one of my favourite films. Nice. I do like the score. I think the score's fabulous. It's got those Greek notes it's, in there. It's, it's a really great, great little theme. There's there's lots of Phrygian scale running mm. throughout the, the, the score, yeah. and it just sounds really nice. Um, so it's, 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 it's good that they got someone so skilled and familiar with that type of music to to do the score for, I think. Yes, yes, it, it really does. It's great. And he himself, a prolific, a prolific uh, composer. And the budget was just over £212,000 in today's money. That would be just over £5 million. Uh, the mm-hmm. film was described as a financial success, but I couldn't find a box office take. Um, it was released in March 1957 in the UK and in July '58 in America, but it was called Night Ambush. And the retro review this week comes from the New York Times by Howard Thompson on the 25th of April, 1958. It's quite a long one, but I think it gets its point across. Night Ambush, which opened yesterday, is a second-rate British adventure drama of World War II made by Powell and Pressburger, two men who emphatically should know better. Three reasons why are Stairway to Heaven, Black Narcissus and The Red Shoes. It might be more to point to cite Pursuit of Graf Bay, a recent work by the writer-director-producer team, and one that at least took war seriously. The most curious and exacerbating aspect of the new picture set on the Nazi-occupied island of Crete is its archness and whimsicality. Almost from the opening scene, adapted from W. Stanley Moss's novel, 
The plot describes how two British intelligence scouts and some friendly natives kidnap a Nazi general and drag him across the mountains to wait to, for a boat. With a pretty good cast headed by Bogard as the chief scout, Marius Goering as the enemy officer, most of the picture appears to have been shot on location with some craggy panoramas that would have been wonderful to see in colour. To put it squarely, this dawdlingly directed entry lacks genuine suspense, wartime urgency and genuine humour while straining frightfully hard for chuckles all the way. Pal and Pressburger may have aimed for a thriller, but they have casually mixed a flat wartime martini. Ah, well, that's done it for us, hasn't it? That's exactly <laughs> what I was <laughs> thinking about the <laughs> film. <laughs> See you next week, folks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah roll it out. See you next week. Um, damn. I know. Uh, yeah, that is that's pretty much spot on. Yeah, they they aim for a joviality within the script, which yeah. I just can't imagine. I can't get behind it. What yeah. was actually? I haven't read. Obviously, I haven't read *Ill Met by Moonlight* the, the book, so I can't um, can't say whether any of that humor is also in the book. And I'm sure there is some humor, and they got on really well with the Cretans, yep. and it was a, a close knit, you know, um, operation. But there's a level of joviality and attempted humor, kitsch humor, mm. which runs throughout this film, which yeah. undercuts any stakes. And suspense. There's a lot of it. When I that's what the film is built on. It's <laughs> are they going to get away with the general that they've kidnapped? Mm. A, are they going to successfully kidnap him? And B, do they get away? And, you know, there's moments in the film where you, you get a little bit of an idea of some of the genuine suspense they could have created. Um, but it gets quickly undermined by other scenes where it's mm. it's it's like, what? And Are the pacing doesn't laugh? help. Yeah. Has, no, exactly. And the pacing doesn't help because it rattles through so far. It does. It does. It's the pacing of the film is good, mm. but you you can't, you're kind of not given a chance to breathe. It's very and, quick and, and appreciate the mm. uh, the difficulty they're having in getting this yeah. general across I wanted, the, like, the terrain, the mountains, yeah. and open ground of Crete. It, it could have been rank organisations, like, you know, meddling, according to Pal and Pressburger, but I feel like we needed more scenes of them trekking through the mountains, it being very difficult and arduous. I never felt like it was difficult or arduous, really, for them. No. Um, I mean, they just seemed to just have a lovely hike, you know. Yeah, some scenes of the Germans actually being within, you know, distance of them. Would Spitting have been, distance would have been good. Yeah, yeah. would have added yeah. suspense. And again, I don't know how close the Germans got and how far mm. ahead they were, but I I believe but in terms of a film, it needed. Yeah, something. there were instances yeah. where they were close, and you know, we're always saying that sometimes films can take a little bit too much artistic license and mm. add things that they should. This one doesn't take enough. <laughs> where, sometimes we, it might feel. Yeah, exactly. You're left wanting just a little bit more, and mm. I know there's a scene and an opportunity we'll talk about in a moment. Um, where they could have done something fairly spectacular and given the film a really oomph of an ending, but mm. don't. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a few things that sort of rankle, don't they? But anyway, getting back to the production. So it's on with the one word reviews. And we had some good ones. We had a, a nice I think we had 40 or 50 entries this week. You can join in with that at uh, Fighting on Film on Twitter. Yeah, please do. We usually put them out. Uh, over the weekends before we record because we record over the weekend um so do look out for them every week so we have ad bond goes with professional uh, uh paul woodage from world war ii tv goes with Ernest. david current says crete ken reaney goes poshos uh stephen proctor goes mountainous paul hicks dirky uh very frank fantastic uh darren skerritt goes amateurs and then he goes with professionals um and Maureen Picard goes with Archers and rounding it off, um, Sir Donald Pig goes audacious. Hmm. Yeah, there's some there's some good ones there, I think. Yeah, um, a lot of people saying, capture. Oh, this is an absolute classic. Can't wait for you to get into it. Um, yeah. So I don't know if they're gonna be disappointed. <laughs> Sorry, they everyone. Might. <laughs> I mean this this was I think the second time I've seen this. I have I vaguely remember this from years ago. So yeah. I vaguely I remember. I always get it confused with They Who Dare. 
Yes, yeah. And I even got it so confused where I posted a picture of they you dare saying we were reviewing Ill Met by Moonlight because it but they're very similar looking. They're I'm both, sure you know... everyone thought that was intentional, Rob. <laughs> that was a very funny joke. Nope. Nope, wasn't it wasn't intentional at all. Um <laughs> I think one of our yeah. followers um actually lost in, I think he's lost in translation on Twitter. He he pointed it out and I was like, oh gosh, yeah, they you're right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just how it goes sometimes um, i mean I, i'll i'll explain my thoughts on the film in final thoughts i think and i'll say yeah, yeah so, I'll, get, I'll get into it a bit more there i think i think now's the time to move into the alley telly it sure is it's time for alley tally on fighting on film yeah there's not much going on because there's not much going on action wise, but it's not really about that. I know mm -hmm. um, it's a very simple plot of kidnap the chap, extract him. Um, you, you've got Dirk and his SOE um, chums going around with M1928 Thompsons. But I think mm -hmm. on the actual raid, I can never remember the, 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 this weapon. I know Matt will know, but if you see pictures of the actual raiding party and the partisans that are with them they've got this very rare submachine gun that looks a little bit like a thompson could you tell the listeners what it is yeah i so rob rob um messaged me on uh, whatsapp and said yeah i don't think they had thompson's i think they had something else that looks a bit like thompson's and i was like oh ud-42s yeah <laughs> Matt because, just, ping, just knows yeah <laughs> because united defense m1942s were uh mostly used uh by soe so, okay. so we got got a, quite a few of them and they dropped them to various cells and, and on various operations. Mm. Um, and they're probably the most prolific user of uh, UD-42s. Um, they're really interesting guns. They are submachine guns. Um, I believe they're 45 ACP, like a Thompson. Right. And they do have a front grip, but they have a, like a, a classic conventional um, yeah. buttstock where you hold on to the buttstock rather than a, a rear pistol grip like the Thompson. They're like someone's trying to draw a Thompson from memory, but not having seen yeah, one in like Thompson, 10 years. It's the Thompson you have at home. Um, <laughs> We've got Thompsons at home. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> you are right. It makes sense. They're good standards, I though. I, I can completely understand them not managing to get you. No, they're teams. very rare. I mean, yeah. yeah, they are. If they're um, shot in Crete, maybe they've got some. You know, maybe. Who knows? Maybe they've been some hanging around. Um, mm. There's some but, revolvers very briefly. Yes, there are, as you mentioned I think, earlier. Uh, I think there's um, are they Webleys or Enfields. I'm not I sure. I can't remember. Mm. Maybe. Um, but they're I not. I like the look that. of. I like the look of the partisans when you first see them. They look very partisan-y. Yeah. They've got the bandoliers. They've got mm -hmm. an odd mix of rifles. There are some number fours in there. There are some some Steyr. They look like Steyrs to me. Really early, like. 20s oh, style yeah. rifles. I, I don't know. I, I used by the Greek police. I can't remember. Really? Okay. Hmm. Yeah, maybe. And there were some definite, like you know, obviously K98s and things like that. Mm -hmm. Obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, but that was nice because it showed that the the SOE influence of, of delivering weapons had come through. I yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, that makes a battle dress and Cretan yeah, traditional nice. wear as well. You know, you've got the chaps with their wings on the their um their battle dress. You've got like the, I think. I can remember, never remember the names of people from this film, like because oh my god, I just it, he he is so a presence in this movie. I forget everyone else. Um, yeah, but people are wearing like you know civilian shirts underneath their BD. It's very relaxed. It's it's not a it's oh, not a Sandy. Stiff upper yeah, type Sandy's thing. very Sandy, relaxed. He's got the yeah. um like a check check uh light shirt yeah. underneath, hasn't he? I like it. It's really nice. And even down, but down to the details of things like that make them that made the partisans and the SOE feel like they'd been embedded for a while. They didn't just didn't feel superficial mm. where you've yeah, got the chap that quite well. Yeah. So the chap's going back on the boat when Sandy comes in and he goes, no, give me your boots. That's our tradition. Come on. He doesn't want to give up his boots and they do. Yeah. So boots you know, are in short supply. Short supply. Yes. Yeah. So you know they've got like supply issues and, and, and things like that. I really like that. Um and then obviously Dirk's costume. That's Ali. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and um, San, I think Sandy says to him, "I like your outfit." And Dirk goes, "I like to, th I like them to think I'm sort of their duke, a latter day Lord Byron." And it's great. <laughs> yeah. it's just he only yeah, he can I mean, pull I, that off. I think I think Dirk would have been great to play Byron. Actually, that would have been would have 
yeah, quite a good great. casting if they'd ever made a film about Larry. But yeah, he does look he does look quite resplendent, doesn't he? He does. But he's only he really in it does. very short. Very briefly. And he's got his scene. jumpers and his his, his yeah. sweater and all that. Yeah, and the knife. And yeah. 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 I like it. Um and then finally, just the only thing that lets the movie down, and it's and it's a 50s sort of war movie trope, I think, where the, the Germans just look okay. Yeah. yeah, they've got the field growl sort of type or the trop more tropical type uniform on yeah yeah but there's nothing Sand to write home about yeah. it's all got mm. mittens belts and you know things like that and then the, you know they were going around in american half tracks and bedford trucks it's just tropey 50 stuff that we love oh was there a betty i missed the betty well i think it was one betty ql it might have been an austin i can't remember but it was it was definitely a, a british truck Ooh, we, have, we haven't had an entry on betty watch for quite we a while haven't, no betty watch had been dead for a while so it was nice to mm. see it um but yeah, apart from that, they really felt like a, a partisan band. And a yeah, they looked the part, SOE didn't they? It, it looked, they did. And the photographs, um, the very few photographs of the Green yeah. Resistance in the SOE cell. Um, yeah, I can, I can, mm. we can, we can let, we can definitely agree that they looked the part. Yeah, they did. They really did. And they, you know, they looked disheveled. They didn't look brand new either. Um, yeah. uh, some of them. Um, but no, it, it's decent enough, I think. Yeah. And that's about it, Ali Wise. There isn't I much going so, on. Yeah. There's a, the, the motor torpedo boat that they come in on. That's kind of cool. Back. Yeah, kind of cool. I like that shot. That That's one of my favourite shots of where they're approaching the island mm. on the boat or where Oxley's approaching the island on the boat. It's nice. Um, and that is the moment I thought, oh, this would be great if it was in Technicolor. It, exactly because it's the whole thing Pound and Pressburger they sh- I think they shoot their movies and they envision their movies to be in colour so mm. it's such a shame this one didn't have it it must have been ranked trying to save a few pounds must have been surely have been. Mm. Um, but anyway I think I mean have you got any more for the Ali Telly this week because it's quite I don't that, I think we've covered everything yeah yeah there's no tanks there's no um, no, there's, there's no, the, like, the General's Mercedes General's Mercedes, uh, that's very nice. Which one of the Cretan part. lads uh, recognises by the sound of mm-hmm. his engine. Which is you a, could an... say that um, boots are quite alley in this because there's a lot of boots-related stuff in the plot. Yeah, yeah, boots are, are a little plot device as well towards the end as well. Yeah, they are. Nico, good old Nico. Right, mm-hmm. so moving on to favourite scenes. Favourite scenes. Hello there, sorry to interrupt. I wanted to let you know that you can now join our supporting cast over on Patreon. As thanks for your support, you'll be able to help us pick films, submit questions for guests, have first pick on brand new and exclusive merch, and much more. Thank you for your support. Now back to the show. So in terms of favourite scenes, for me, I think the one that stands out is the fog scene. They're on the run. um, And it's the scene that gives you the most uh, um, impression of jeopardy and suspense mm-hmm. within the whole escape yep. um, element of the film and um, the last two acts and um, it kind of underlines what could have been done with the film a little bit I think mm. um, because even that scene doesn't really ramp up the tension uh, no. as much as it could Um and then, even then, it's kind of, there's, a, there's a scene later on where um, the general's been put on a horse because he's pretending to be injured, mm-hmm. sorry, a donkey. Yeah. Um, and there's a bit of tension where they think, oh, we're being followed. Like one of the, the Cretan resistance members says, like, Philodem, Philodem, um, we're being followed. I think we're being followed. Yes. And they, they kind of like take up positions. Uh, that I think Derek draws his revolver, and that's the scene where you see the revolvers. Um, yes. They're, they're ready then, for a scrap at that point, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. you think, oh, okay, hmm. a bit of jeopardy. Uh, and then two, a couple of goats come down the track, and it's another moment of geniality. Yeah. Playing it off, for, um, playing it off for comedy, really. Yeah. You know, and you could have done that without That's playing fine, it for laughs. That's fine, but you have to have. Yeah. You have to have some mm. sequences which are serious and hold the weight. Yeah. That you can juxtapose that comedic element against, um, but because it's all fairly light-hearted. The whole escape is relatively lighthearted. The, the hardship doesn't feel um, no. particularly real. Yeah, you know they, so they take undermines. their battle dress jackets off and you see them in their shirt sleeves, but they don't look—they don't look like they've been walking for eighteen days. No, 
I don't feel that. Um, it just it gets a little bit muddled, I think. And I know where you, I know what, how you feel. Yeah, but you're right about the mist. They could have done more there. And obviously, I know that. I don't know if whether the Germans pursued them through these mountains, as as like the movie doesn't suggests. You know, so yeah. Obviously, it's my it's my ignorance of not knowing enough about the operation, but um, could have done a bit more, a little bit maybe a bit more artistic license. You know, I never felt yeah. they were in that much danger. You know, even the elements could have been a danger to them, and it didn't feel like they that came in enough. Yeah, yeah. I like, mean, I, there are films that do similar sequences like that, um, mm. where the you know people have been pursued. Here's a telemark. Um, yeah, the guns are never own. Yeah, um, have pursuit scenes where there's you genuinely feel like they are being pursued mm. in this real jeopardy, and I think with this film it would have benefited. Uh, yeah, I think it would have done having a yeah. little bit more of serious tension in place, and, and it's maybe rank not letting Dirk maybe get that shoveled. Perhaps it could be in his contract that he's got to look as kempt as he can be at any one given time. Perhaps so. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. You know, even they could have got you? beards. Have you got a favorite stuff. scene? Yeah, I've. It's more of a favorite sequence. I think the capture of Crep is really well done. Mm. Um, the whole setting up, being at the crossroads, learning the movements of the car. You know, trusting the partisans to know the movements enough when they've captured the general and they're in the car. Yeah, it's they're driving through the streets and the hills, and it's this whole fear and and the being like you know you got Dirk chain smoking. I think it's a really nice little detail um, that that you, you do is very noticeable. Um, he's very very anxious, and then they get through the sea that sea of Germans. That's a beautiful shot. You know, mm. they could be found any moment. That's really great. And then the fear goes to jubilation once they get through that big checkpoint and they and get some really great dialogue where the, the, the comedic tension does work. The, the, com- the comedy element does work because they're happy they've done the job. It's like long yeah. live the Cretans, up the rebels. Um, and then after that is where my final thoughts come in, really. The first half hour of this movie is really great. The, the pacing and the tension and the fear is good. You know, capturing this big German general, yeah. really great. And then it delves into a generic sort of cat and mouse chase. And I've got it in my notes where we see a lot of the mouse, but very little of the cat. Yeah, that's very true. And and that it just never feel like they were in true danger right until the end. And obviously, if the operation is like that, and that's great. But as a movie, I just want a little bit more. Like, I feel like Nico, Nico's betrayal could come in. Could, the general could have been working on that the whole way through. Yeah. Could have been sort of chipping away at Nico's morality. It could have been a bit more there. Because I know Pal and Pressburger can do that because they did it with um, Matter of Life and Death. They did it with Life and Death of Colonel Blimp. It, it's just in this one, they can't work out the tone, whether it's serious, like that review said. And I did read that review uh, like a few days after I'd watched the film, so I'm not basing my opinion on something I've read beforehand. Um, we do go into these movies blind, and whether yeah. we've seen them or not. Um but I just felt, yeah, it gets it right. It tonally, it's all over the shop. It doesn't, it doesn't. It wants to make you laugh. It wants to make you fearful. But it can't, it can't grab one properly. Um, and 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 yeah. But money for jam is a great line, and I do like it. That. Is and there's some there's some good lines like the bit where they they describe themselves as amateurs, mm. um, and it, and it circles back to that at the end where the general admits that you know they're. They, they are professionals. Amateurs, they're professionals. Mm. Uh, which, there's an element of him wanting to believe he's been captured by professionals. Yeah, of um, course. Yeah, I think. and and he's Gagurin doing a great job. He's really well yeah. cast in this. Yeah, he's a serious foil to some of the um, mm. yeah. charisma, some of the charisma of, um, of of Dirk. Yeah, they play off it, each other quite well. Hello, I'm Al Murray, and you're listening to Fighting on Film, the world's number one war film podcast. Moving into final thoughts, uh, I suppose we should probably talk about the missed opportunity at the end. Again, might almost be a cost-cutting exercise, and Paul and Pressberg handle it quite nicely. But there's a sequence at the end of the film where the Germans have been chasing them, and uh, a company of Germans have occupied a beach, the beach that they're going to exfil from, mm. um, and they're expecting to meet the motor launch at. And they don't know what to do. They don't know how they're going to get through them. They can't fight through them. Um, yeah. And eventually, spoilers, Nico leads them away very cleverly. Um, 
That's good tension. Oh, that's very good tension. It's a good. Scene. That's yeah. that's one of the best parts of the film. Um, and it would have been even better that whole sequence if they'd shown the ambush that had been laid for these Germans that Nico leads away. Mm-hmm. Um, but instead, we get a rather tasteful um, shot of a canyon with some reverberating gunfire sounds and echoes, yeah. um, intimating that there's a, an ambush going on. But we don't see any of it. Even if we'd just seen a little bit of it, I think mm. that would have. Um, I think it would have been quite helped. empowering as well for the for these for the characters as well. Yeah. That, that, you know, we've been we've led to believe in this movie. Obviously, we know these partners are incredibly brave, and they're you know they're they're they're, they're going to lose a lot regardless of what they're doing. If they get captured, they're in trouble. You know, if if they do any attacking, they're in trouble because the reprisals are you know mm-hmm. absolutely horrible. And obviously that the reprisals were bad when yes, the yeah. crep was was removed from the island and then there was a, a, a not a very nice situation for, for the for the Cretans afterwards. Yeah, there was a wave um, of uh, reprisals and Yeah. Um but yeah, I I think it would have elevated the film a little bit. And I, I I know Powell and Pressberger were more than capable of filming something of like that. Doing that. Yeah, it just so, a little missed opportunity perhaps just for a little firefight. Perhaps just, a funding thing. It, it might have been money. I mean, maybe it's just me at this point. I I was a little bit, I wouldn't say bored, but I was like, come on, I want some action now. That you need it. I I never felt like they you need weren't it in gonna, a 50s war film. <laughs> yeah, I never felt like they weren't going to escape. No, I never felt like they weren't going to get out. Yeah, I, that, the, I think the, that's what I wasn't. Me. Uh, I didn't. It didn't create a genuine fear for me as a as a, a viewer. No, um, to believe that they weren't going to escape, and I wanted I, and, to see Dirk fire that Thompson so fucking badly. Oh, I know. Yeah, that would have been great. <laughs> yeah, that would have been great. Just Hello. popping up from behind a, a stone wall, please. Letting, letting off a mag, or you know, silently yeah. dispatching a, a a sentry or something. Just something, yeah. you know. Like I wouldn't have. I obviously may, maybe Pound Pressburger wanted this. They wanted to do a serious, as much as they could, re- recreation of events, fair play. Yeah. But I think for the audience, <laughs> perhaps, you know, I'm not well, I'm not saying that war movies can't be nuanced and have a lot to say. Look at the Cruel Sea in the same decade. But, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, this one just felt like it was a bit more boys' own in, in places. Yeah, you know? yeah. I, it just needed a little bit more. I mean, to, to be, to, to round out things in, in my um, my thoughts, the characters are likable. Um, it's beautifully shot. Yes, it, w- it would have been better in color, um, Much better. but it's still still beautifully shot. I do appreciate that it stayed close to the reality of the the operation, um, in that there were no running battles and big action. No, it was um, great. It was, it's good that it's grounded, but then it's also pushed not. It's into very the film. Old. Yeah, yes, it it's just needs a little more. And, and perhaps it perhaps it would have been absolutely fine as it was. Um, without any of that action added, if it had been a little bit less jovial in places, mm. um, yeah, it's the whole, it's the tonal shift really quickly. So, and, and this is in my notes, so just, I've got to mention it. It's and maybe you, you'll have it in yours as well. But it's when they're waiting at the crossroads, and it's just before they do the capture, and they realise that Crep's coming, and there's that character, and and he goes the general, like, and he runs yeah. off to like get ready. I'm like. That's like a sitcom line. That's like a comedy yeah. line. Yeah. yeah, it's so tonally off for me. It's really I, Keystone I, I Cops. I didn't mind a lot of the humour and um, those elements when we were getting to know the Cretans when mm. Oxley arrived. Um, Oxley's um, Moss, Moss, yeah. the, char- the, the character arrived. Um, that worked well, but for it to continue in moments of jeopardy, I. Didn't think that worked as well. I, I mm. a little bit more tension would have been great. Um, yeah, it's got pre- Pound and Pressburger humor where it does need it. Yeah, I think that's I think that's it, and I think it's mm. a rare depiction of the war in the Mediterranean Aegean. Yes, um, and it, and that's a positive, but it really made me think. It really made me want to see Anthony Quayle's book about Albania and the yeah, SME. yeah, uh, eight hours from from London. Um, or yeah, England. got that on my shelf. Um, Need to read it. Uh, adapted, I think. Yeah, I, it's it just it just needed a little something more for me, and I can mm. understand that it, people enjoy it as a you know one of those Sunday afternoon classic romp 
classic fifties movies. Fifties era British films. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I don't think it does the operation the justice um, that it could have done because a lot of civilians got killed in yes. reprisal. Yeah. Yes. Which there's no mention of that after the end of the film no. either. Um, no, there's not. I believe. And of course, but, there isn't with most of these movies, really. No. Um, but you'd be you'd be you'd be forgiven for just thinking that this was a um, men on a mission made up operation. Yeah, you might think that. Yeah. Um, whereas, unlike Guns and Navarone, this actually did happen. Yes. Yes. And was real. It was a real operation, which is mm. kind of counterintuitive. It's odd, isn't it? It's a bit. And I think as well. I think learning about how Dirk was treated really pissed me mm. off a bit because I'm like, who else do you get in in the late fifties? You Dirk, but. Um, David Niven, he's getting a bit yeah. too old, even David then. David Niven, perhaps, yeah. You know, Stan- Stanley Baker, too tough, maybe. Mm, mm. Michael Caine's not not come online yet, really, that, in that era. Todd. Maybe Richard Todd. Maybe been a bit Todd, tight-cost by then. Yeah, Todd wouldn't... I don't think Todd would have had the flamboyance for it. No. There's some, Dirk brings what only Dirk can bring to this film. Yeah. And I Todd's understand why Rank cast him. And the commanding yeah. presence... But he, I don't think he'd bring the flamboyance that Dirk could bring to the yeah. role. And it seems like the role want, needed a little bit of flamboyance. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it feels like a little, that. little flourish. Just, it just rankled with me after learning all that. I was like, that's not fair. Yeah. He's, he does a really good job in this. And I know it, it did rankle with him. It annoyed him at the time because mm. he felt like he'd given a good performance. And all the reviews came out and they were like, oh, this man's completely wrong. And he was like, hang on, I'm just doing what I've been told by my bosses. Given, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, it's not, I, I struggle to say whether I'd recommend it, but if, if you haven't seen it and you need to and adding it to your list of, uh, war movies, you haven't seen it, please do. But it's not one that stuck with me for weeks after. Mm-hmm. It's, it's Within that the context kind of, movie. of British fifties war movies. I think it's important because it's a depiction of the war in the Mediterranean and the Aegean yeah, of course. Uh, on Crete. And that's very rare. Um, so in that regard, I think it's worth taking a look at. Um, mm. It's an interesting one. It definitely is an interesting one. Yeah, and, and there we go. Exactly, and it's well. I think it's worth watching for the restoration alone because it's beautiful. If you've got the, yeah. the, oh, the TV and the means mm. for it, it's great. Beautifully shot, of course. And there is a I must have, uh, remember while we're, we're still on air. There is a good documentary uh, about the operation, about um, the men who did it having a reunion in the 70s called Reunion of Enemies. You can find it on YouTube. Um, it's, it's a Greek production. Um, and there was also on World War II TV, Kyle Glover did a uh, presentation um, about this uh, very operation. So please go and over to those and find those. Um, I'm fans of history here, I'm sure you'll history rage. Fans of history rage as well. Go and see what Kyle Glover does in his day-to-day as well so there you go that was ill met by moonlight another patreon pick for you and we love we love the picks that you're choosing um because then you're knocking out the park guys so please if yeah. you want to get involved please do so it definitely helps support the show um and there's other packs on there as well so definitely do check it out please do and we will catch you next week and as always you can catch the back catalog of the show on fighting on film dot com and we'll catch you next week have a good one guys now even more searchable yes thanks for listening guys bye bye bye